So um, on on the subject of mutual aid, um, it looks like we have Amber Frost with us now. Um, I think that our viewers are probably familiar with Amber as a writer. <laughs> hey, Amber. Amber hey, is a writer. Amber. <laughs> For Jacobin and the Baffler, um, she is also co-host of Chapo Trap House. And I want to mention that Amber, you reviewed Dean Spade's book on mutual aid, and you you have a critique of kind of some of the arguments for mutual aid, and that's going to be coming out in Jacobin um, probably later this week. Uh, when it hits, we'll put the yeah. link. We'll put the link in the description box below. Right. So, um, welcome to the Jacobin Show. Thank you for having me. Of course. <laughs> so I, I guess um, to kind of dive in, I so you know there there you have you have some pretty pointed critiques of mutual aid, and I think we should sort of start by laying out. I mean, we'll get to those in a second, but I think we should sort of start by laying out like what people mean when they say mutual aid, because I think that there's sort of a broad conception of mutual aid where it's like, you know, um, like a non-state network of support right so mm -hmm. for people who you know are sort of in in facing like a natural disaster or some other kind of hardship uh oftentimes neighbors you know friends families strangers even will sort of pool resources or come together um especially if government aid is kind of lacking or even non-existent um and this form of i guess you know community cooperation or like community care some people call it has been around like forever basically it's it's definitely not new um, yeah, and actually I, I don't actually i would say i don't even think it makes sense to really call it a practice it's just kind of like right. pe people are nice and care about each other right people are nice and care about right exactly it's like pretty intuitive in many ways mm -hmm. um and i also want to say that this was sort of the default social safety net like before the new deal so uh, which you know i, I right. mean we we can get into that later but um and that works uh, great didn't it yeah exactly yeah. exactly that's that's really just Everyone all i wanted it. to say yeah. <laughs> yeah. right right <laughs> Um, uh, I mean, I think I think definitely the shortcomings of that model were exposed in that moment as well as other moments. Um, but I guess my question for actually both of you is um, the way that the, the way that mutual aid is often discussed now, um, it's talked about as this as something that can transform society. I hear that word transformative a lot. And um, what, I mean, like, what do you make of that? Um. Well, I mean, unless Paul, unless you want to go first. Oh, no, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I guess the definition that Spade uses, it's pretty specific. And it does draw this distinction between uh, charity and mutual aid. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm just going to pull from the book because I don't, I don't want to misquote. Um, Survival work when done in con conjunction with social movements demanding transformative change is called mutual aid. Now that's, uh, um, you know, a small consolidation of things. Uh, obviously like, you know, he goes forth to sort of expand on that. Um, the thing is, I don't know how that actually differs from charity, even in a contemporary sense. Um, this might seem pedantic, but I, I think uh, making that distinction or looking for that distinction is really sort of important um, because not everything that is good to do is socialism and not everything that is like socialism is um, immediately like uh, emotionally gratifying or even social for that matter. I mean, socialism is a lot of spreadsheets and phone calls. <laughs> like. Uh, Organizing is a lot of, uh, you know, phone banking and tedious things. Um, I think one of the issues that I like first go into is the is I'm not sure you can argue any sort of historical precedent for a mutual aid program actually building power. Um, mm -hmm. I realize that's sort of a that's sort of a, a a big a big claim, but I think the onus is sort of on the proponents of mutual aid to argue that it it has worked in the past. Um, one of the things that people always tend to turn to, I mean, like everyone from ASA to like the History Channel uh, always refers to like the Black Panther Breakfast Program, 
Um, Wait, and on that note, we actually have some clips of of those very <laughs> that very phenomenon. Okay. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So so AOC uh, had a tweet uh, that sort of summarized an Instagram post that she had made. Um, and she wrote, um, you know, today in my IG story, how the black Panther people's free, uh, how the black Panthers people's free food program led to free and reduced school meal policies nationwide and inspired her, uh, COVID, you know, mutual aid operation. Um, and this claim was actually also there. She is on Instagram. Um, this claim was also repeated in the New Yorker recently in an article on mutual aid. Um, and the author wrote, you know, Bay Edgar Hoover worried that the program would threaten efforts by authorities to neutralize the BPP and destroy what it stands for. A few years later, the federal government formalized its own breakfast program for public schools. So the idea here is that the Black Panthers, through their serve the people sort of mutual aid programs, mm -hmm. force the hand of the state. Um, is well, the dates on that just don't match up. Like, uh, th that's just, that's not what happened. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I don't know how this keeps going past uh, fact checkers, even in the New Yorker, who uh, you know notoriously have very good uh, fact checkers. But the Child Nutrition Act was passed in '66. I'm sorry, I'm looking at my notes here. Um, and You're already that, doing more work than a New Yorker fact checker. <laughs> You're already <laughs> yeah, killing yeah. it. <laughs> right, right. Um, it uh, yeah, um, and it, it extended the National School Lunch Program, which was mm -hmm. passed in '46, and that was a that was a New Deal program. Of course it was. <laughs> of course it was, yeah. Um, and Johnson said the breakfast program was was finishing the, the FDR program. Mm -hmm. um, and it was related to the agricultural sort of department. So, I mean, the, the first thing is that, like, this program preceded the Black Panthers. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know how they would have retroactively done that. Um, well, a lot of it seems to rest on that Hoover quote. I mean, he really did say, you know, right. oh, so yeah. Here's the problem with that. Um, just because someone wants to neutralize you doesn't mean you're necessarily a threat to power. And it, mm -hmm. it might, in fact, mean that you're weak. Um, I would say the New Deal is a good example of this. Uh, you know, the arguments that the New Deal were a concession to radicalizing labor are true. Mm -hmm. Um, that's because that's what you do when a movement is strong. You can't smoosh it and you're like, oh, this is getting, this is getting out of hand. We're not going to be able to fight this. We have to give them something. Mm -hmm. Um, in many instances, uh, someone crushing you, uh, may just be because you're easy to crush. I mean, the example I tend to use, uh, when people are like, oh, well, they're scared. We must be, we must be winning. It's like, well, do you? Do you really think, like, say, for example, Palestinians are a genuine threat to the state of Israel? Because there's a lot of Israelis that are very scared of Fatah and are very scared of, of people living in, like, an open-air ghetto. That doesn't mean that, like, you know, Palestine is on the verge of, of being liberated or mm -hmm, anything. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that a lot of fears are sort of irrational. Um, and I think that the... Um, I think that the quote does indicate obviously an antipathy towards the Panthers, um, but I don't think they were ever any competition for any sort of federal welfare state. And they certainly, mm -hmm. just on a pure timeline, didn't influence the breakfast program. That just, mm -hmm. that didn't happen. Right. And I don't know I what mean, to say, it didn't happen. <laughs> right. I mean, and even, even if, I mean, even it didn't happen. So like we, probably shouldn't go down that road but i was going to say yeah. even if they even if there was some sort of like cross pollination or you know um the you know great society architects were like oh well we should really amp up our you know federal breakfast mm -hmm. program because like right. the panthers are doing it the right. fact is also the case i mean it's also the case that the panthers i mean their breakfast program was admirable they fed what like 20,000 kids or something in the first year of establishing the program but the federal government fed so many right. more <laughs> Like those and I think are, are a little, they, they, yeah, <laughs> like the they fed like eighty thousand, and I think the Panthers fed ten thousand according mm -hmm. to my numbers. Right. Um, okay. Yeah, so speaks to I mean this question of why is it not transformative because it's just the scale problem. Mm -hmm. And right. I mean, I think I'm jumping the gun on this, but like there's so many other organizations or charities or whatever that can do this kind of thing more to scale than the left can. 
Um, and none of them can do it to the scale that the federal government can do it if they're going to do something, you know? For sure, uh, for sure. Yeah. I think the objection I sort of have is that, 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 that the, the distinction that Spade makes with charity also sort of, I mean, it sort of undermines charity. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, this idea that we're still operating off of the, you know, the old starvation army, uh, pie in the sky when you die, read the Bible and then you get a bowl of soup thing. Like there's actually tons of charity that's mm -hmm. either associated with like religions or communities or or whatever that has nothing to you know the Sikhs having an open kitchen for meals or whatever mm -hmm. they don't say oh here's your turban like this is just they're people do do those sorts of things through right. communities. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think so. So I'm also like a little familiar with, you know, the various arguments or the, the distinction that people make between mutual aid as quote solidarity and charity. And it always seems to rely on a definition of charity, uh, which you alluded to, which is like very narrow, you know? So like mm -hmm. when you actually like dig into what proponents of mutual aid who distinguish it from charity mean, they always bring up the NGO sector um, and kind of like big philanthropy, which like, you know, socialists obviously have criticisms of as well. Like we all have criticisms of that as well. Um, but that, but I don't think that that is the scope of charity. Um, and then they also talk about charity being a kind of inherently hierarchical, like top down system where somebody like the is Black sort Panthers of- <laughs> who operated by consensus. <laughs> right, yeah. right, yeah. Right, I know, that's another thing. Like the Panthers obviously also had a sort of ideolo hierarchical. ideological program they were hierarchical and, yeah. you know, their breakfast program, like, again, like, I think it was great, um, but there was also still an ideological component, you know, so. Oh, 100%. That was not, those were not, you know, that those, those breakfasts did come with strings attached. It wasn't. <laughs> it, it wasn't it, a free it, breakfast. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, 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 it wasn't read your Bible, but it was, you know, right. read your, read your 10 point program or, or right. whatever. I read mean, your little red book or something. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They, they literally sold little red books initially to, to pay for, well, guns. Uh, and, and other things, <laughs> right, like, right, uh, right. you know, that's, that's um, it was an ideological project. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that that is one of the problems with charity and with mutual aid, is that mm -hmm. there are strings attached, and, and people kind of resent that. I, I don't think you should... Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I do believe in giving time, resources, like the other things like charity is good and, and, and mm -hmm. not even in an altruistic way. It just makes you feel like less of a piece of shit. Mm -hmm. It's good for you to do yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So that was kind of my follow up question. Like, what's wrong with charity? I mean, like the NGO side or, you know, the kind of like like um, those those weird church charities which do exist, which like, you know, shame like unwed moms or like, you know, totally. won't like give you stuff if you're gay or whatever. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, like that's definitely a thing. But like, as you were saying, there are also plenty of religious charities that don't do that. Um, and, and like, I don't think that there's anything really wrong with charity or, you know, with like volunteering. Right. As socialists, I mean, the traditional critique of charity is that it's been sold to us as a substitute right? Uh, for, uh, for, you know, uh, workers controlling the means of production. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, the thing is, that's also my uh, argument against sort of mutual aid is that it's supposed to be a substitute for mm -hmm. workers right. controlling the means of production. Mm -hmm. And aside from what Paul said about like, just a matter of scale, um, they do have all the stuff. Like, <laughs> right. I, I, I'm not sure how to, I, I'm not sure people are quite so, um, uh, quite so aware at how extreme wealth has been concentrated in the past, you know, like decade even. But it's like, um, this is why I always said, like, remember, uh, like Mad Max Fury Road? Of course. <laughs> right. So fun. Uh, <laughs> that came out sort of around the same time as Snowpiercer. Mm. And people loved Snowpiercer. They're like, this is like socialist. And I'm like, no, they blew up like the one piece of wealth they had. They should have taken it. Um, yeah. Whereas, uh, you know, in Mad Max, they're like, we're going to escape this evil empire and go out and find greener pastures. And they're like, oh, shit, uh, the only good things left are owned by the evil empire. So we mm -hmm. have to go back and expropriate it. Mm -hmm. And I think in many ways, mutual aid is sort of, you know, in, in the way, same way that UBI is, it's an attempt to circumvent uh, a class conflict. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a 
attempt, it's an attempt to create some kind of socialist or more egalitarian society mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. confronting the reality that very small number of people own all the wealth. Right, right, right. And I think, you know, the key phrase in that one of the spade quotes you read is that, you know, when done in conjunction with social movement organizing, mm -hmm. you know, but the problem is, I think it's rearing its head as its own strategy, you know, it's its own center of work as Just Meet You Wait, you right. know, like the kind of cooperation mutual aid you'll see with workers on strike. Yeah, I mean, okay, that's mutual aid, but the meat and potatoes is the strike. You know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah, is, yeah, yeah. The mutual aid is the auxiliary of that. And I guess a, a question coming out of this is, you know, a, a common thing I hear people on the left say is like, well, mutual aid is a way to connect with communities first as an entry point to organize on other issues. Like yeah. we'll do the mutual aid and then we'll organize on housing, whatever. I, w what do you think of that? I mean, I'd say, first of all, that um, the problem is, is that people are trying to sort of either uh, supplant um, communities that already exist. I remember this very much in Occupy when someone said, like, this is the project. We're creating a community. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, fuck, I already have a community. Like, <laughs> I don't I don't want to be in yours. I just want health care. <laughs> Um, and if this political project is contingent on uh, essentially like, uh, you know, supplanting a, a community um, that already exists or just like a scooping people up who are uh, disenfranchised enough. And I mean, so many people obviously are so mutual aid is very appealing to especially now, like lonely people who don't have, a, you know, a church group or don't come from a union tradition or or aren't from the sort of, uh, you know, I have an Elks Lodge, what, what the hell ever. <laughs> right. like, Whatever just, happened to the Elks Lodge? <laughs> oh, yeah, I bring back lodges or working men's clubs or something like that. Um, you know, I, I don't, uh, I, I guess it's a way of scooping up people that are sort of uh, totally atomized. Mm -hmm. um, but for the people who actually do have a coherent community, they're like, what, I don't, I, I'll just do this through, Church. I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't need a, a girl with a septum piercing to give me an anti-racist training before I can pass out groceries. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think so. Before you came on, um, something that Paul and I were talking about uh, was, you know, how beneficial the public sector has been to Black workers. Um, how how Black how Black voters, uh, you know, sort of overwhelmingly voted for FDR and the New Deal. Um, and I think that, like, I don't actually. I I don't. So, okay, so we're in we're in what is, you know, un, undeniably a crisis. And um, a lot of the articles on mutual aid have kind of pointed that out and have talked mm -hmm. about how you know, there's been this massive failure of the state. All true. You know, obviously, over yeah, the yeah. summer, we had, you know, uh, protests against police violence. So I guess, you know, you could say state violence. And the, the idea is that this is what's generating the interest in mutual aid. And I think maybe for a subset of people, that's true. But it's also the case that during the coronavirus, we've seen, you know, um, polls that indicate that an overwhelming number of people, regardless of their political affiliation, want more government stimulus. Uh, mm -hmm. We already know from, you know, uh, years of polling that Medicare for all is more popular than ever. We just mm -hmm. saw a national election that had higher turnout than like at a higher like percentage of people turned out than like at any time in the last 120 years. Like, I just don't see a why. I mean, I don't see a wide scale antagonism toward the state in this, you know, pro mutual aid way. Um, I and, think and what that's, you're saying is people want to live in a society, not a community. I, I think that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I the, the example I would use for this is because, like, you know, I'm from Tornado Alley and I remember um, it wasn't Katrina. It was, it, it's hard to keep all the trips keep track of all the disasters. The disasters, yeah. Right. <laughs> and I would I saw this sort of anarchist uh, thing where they're like, there are people walking around asking for people's information, you know, theme and it's like, yeah, so you can get a check. Right. Like right. like it, yeah. Or like, at least like a like, first aid kit or something. Like <laughs> the, the relationship that the people where I'm from have to FEMA is like, oh yeah, the people who give me a check. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um 
this whole idea. They're kind of, of like the people who, you know, used to show up at bars with, who work for Camel with like bags of free cigarettes yeah, yeah. that mm -hmm. they would yeah. give to you if you, if you like yeah. put your information into the, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, FEMA is just like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. sorry, that's not, that's not actually a good example because clearly <laughs> the cigarette makers are evil and uh, a cigarette is maybe not a public good, but. <laughs> right, but if you want to spend your, your FEMA uh, check on uh, cigarettes, by the way, they're not going to, they're not right. going to tell you how you need to spend it. Like right, that, right, that's right, right. a very good example of like, oh shit, here's some money. You might also need a smoke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, so that so that actually reminds me that you know, um, mutual aid I think is often discussed as a form of prefigurative politics, right? Which is a term that we right. heard a lot during the Occupy era, and um, you know, viewers viewers may be familiar with this term, but it's basically this idea that uh, you know people and activists can sort of enact or like. Uh, will into being the society that they want to see through changing their, you know, uh, uh, social relations right. or like the way that they live and like how they consume um, and so on and so forth. Mood and board politics. I'm going to manifest it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Kind of and, new yeah, and and so so it's interesting to me that um, again this kind of uh, attitude sort of seems to be resurfacing again with this new interest from the left in mutual aid. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I wonder if you guys, if either of you guys have thoughts about why, why it kind of seemed to die down post Occupy and now it's back. I mean, I think for, for leftists it has, but when you look at um, some of the early coverage of like mutual aid programs, which by the way, don't, it, I, I would say one of the, uh, confusing things about Spade's book is that he uh, sort of marries uh, mutual aid with consensus model stuff. So like mm -hmm. half the book is like, do mutual aid, it's good, here's how it works. And the other half is like kind of HR trading for consensus stuff. And it's like, well, that's one um, sort of administrative approach to doing this thing. So you kind of get in the weeds, like being like, these aren't necessarily the same thing. Like I said, like, the Panthers didn't use consensus. And so like your example is already all over the place. Um, so there's that, but like when you sort of read or, you know, even just talk to people that are delivering groceries or, um, or you know, uh, sorting through resources or making phone calls and doing checks and um, getting people signed up for things and the stuff that was, you know, going on in New York, what they actually liked about it was that they thought it was not political, mm -hmm. um, which again, not everything that that is that is kind or compassionate. Like you know, socialists don't have a, a monopoly on compassion or generosity right. or kindness, um, and thank God because there aren't that many of us. Um, <laughs> right. right. <laughs> uh, and I think people are gravitating towards mutual aid because they they feel personal responsibility to the people around them. Um, I don't think the majority of people participating in it, beyond maybe a small sort of um, group of, of people uh, with an intellectual interest in, in politics, really uh, think like, yes, this is this is the politics. They're like, shit, people are in trouble, and I and mm -hmm. I, I want to help. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I think it also kind of speaks to the fact that for so many decades we've kind of lost this experience of strategy and, and how to really organize to win mm -hmm. um so like people are gravitating towards mutual aid instead of like how do we dig ourselves out of this mess and increase our power and it kind of got back to what i was saying earlier where i've heard many leftists say you know this is us we are preparing to take over the state like we are doing these administrative functions that is getting us ready for the revolution or this thing and it's a very different way of looking at it than for example, some of these new left yeah. parties that are emerging, um, not just in Europe, but a lot of them in Europe, like the left bloc, Podemos, Syriza, all of these, of course, a very messy, hard process. But to me, that is the experience of gaining power and preparing ourselves maybe to run the state or, or, or to take over. That That is the po political process mm -hmm. that they're engaging with, you know, not necessarily mutual aid. Like, I, I, we're not preparing ourselves by doing that. But I think it just reflects like a lack of of imagination of being able mm -hmm. to even start to think of how to lay out like a medium and long-term strategy to get right. from where we are to where we need to be. Right. And there's no real consensus uh, among, <laughs> I, I didn't mean, no pun intended, but there's no real consensus among mutual aid advocates, whether the, um, 
uh, or evangelists really, uh, whether the uh, the goal is to take over the state, which is mine. I'm a, I'm an old school, you know, dictatorship of the proletariat kind <laughs> of girl, or to abolish it. And um, you know, Spade sort of likes these uh, localist kind of um, you know geographically centralized things, which again, I think just ignores the reality of the way that wealth is concentrated even just geographically um and also like i don't i can't make insulin in my bathtub like i don't i don't know it <laughs> like uh we, we have this uh wonderful um infrastructure um you know it's just out of reach um and to just go back to the to you know marx's uh sort of approach to capitalism it's like wow this really lurched us forward mm -hmm. um you know, the state development, economic planning, um, redistribution, those are not the enemy, those are the prize. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that requires, like, to my mind, a form of democracy and governance that is uh, democratic, but is not um, completely diffused. Mm -hmm. Uh, across a bunch of little like isolated islands of, right. I mean, that's, I think one of the, I, I wrote something for the last Jacobin about how socialists should be Republicans is kind of a gotcha. Uh, but the idea that we need to finish reconstruction, I mean, one of the, mm -hmm. one of the big obstacles to socialism in this country has been the fact that it's not a country, it's 50 small countries mm -hmm. um, with borders that uh, are completely permeable to capital but uh, are major obstacles to labor. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to repeat that. I want to be big. Right. Like we don't need we don't need like American federalism dialed up to like a thousand. <laughs> yeah. And also, I think like too like I, I, I have these. It's just very strange to me because I don't think there's anything that suggests that. Um, that there's anything more humane or kind or egalitarian or even like efficient about um, community mm -hmm, mm -hmm. than there is yeah. about a system. I mean, like I'm from a small town, the community can be ruthless. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's another thing. I mean, I, 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 I hear this a lot um, by proponents of mutual aid who sort of either explicitly or implicitly say, um, well, this is non-hierarchical, you know, this is this is horizontalist, this is somehow more egalitarian than um, the state. You know, we, we had brought in Dean Spade's critique of the New Deal um, mm -hmm. at the beginning so um, he basically says, you know, the New Deal and- New Deal is racist. This is another thing. The New Deal is racist. Yeah, the New Deal is racist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and and also that, you know, these these sort of state administrative systems will just never be free of like racialized and gendered hierarchy and so on and so forth. But it's like, will the Have community you ever lived in a small town? Right. right. About racialized right. And right. Gender? Exactly. Like, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. If, I mean, those social when states relations get their rights. They'll be fine. You know? right, right. <laughs> they would have gotten their rights. You know, we just need micro states. <laughs> right, yeah. Right. People certainly if, want if only there had been more civil wars. <laughs> <laughs> people certainly won't form their communities around things like religion mm -hmm. or uh, or race or income. I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the the phrase that goes with community for me so often, the word that comes before it is gated. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I will say I I do want to keep Philadelphia a community. We are pure and we are good and. Uh, it's the last working you... class city in America. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't want you Yankee. Uh, government people in Philadelphia. <laughs> uh, I thought, I'm loving it in Philadelphia. I'm welcomed immediately. Doesn't Philadelphia has like, doesn't Philadelphia have like geographical splits? Like, isn't there like South Philly, which is like ethnic whites and like those union bars where you can't go in unless yeah. you like it? <laughs> Philly is actually a really fascinating place from a class. I mean, I'm not kidding when I say, I think it probably is the last working class city in America. Mm -hmm. Um, it, and it's because of, uh, I don't, Paul might know more about this than me, but it, it, to my understanding, it's because of a, of an early housing program and it has just one of the highest rates of working class home ownership mm. of anywhere in the country. Was um, the housing and, program federal? Uh, I think the funds were. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, cause what is, what's like rural 
Pennsylvania going to do to, you know, like it's, these places are totally different. Um, right. Uh, and yeah, and you know, it's a strong union town and a lot of that has been because like a base level of security has been, um, established in, in, in housing and in affordable mm -hmm. housing. And I, I have a few friends that are teachers there and they're like, I mean, it's incredibly hard work, um, mm -hmm. because they have very poorly funded schools and they're like, well, I gotta say it's. It's it's not the best, and my classrooms are crowded, and we don't get enough mm -hmm. resources. But no one's ever going to gentrify Philadelphia because these are not attractive schools. <laughs> Paul, confirm or deny? <laughs> well, still happen. They got the they got the <laughs> yeah. charters. They can do that. They get but... they get it. They get you in the end. But it is like that's uh you know that's one of the reasons it's going to be you know uh it's going to at least be work more slowly mm -hmm. um because mm -hmm. otherwise i mean man i could buy a city block in philadelphia <laughs> like, mm -hmm. it's really affordable housing mm -hmm. and actually i mean you're because i'm also in the teachers union in philly and um this kind of jogged my mind because a lot of people bring up well you know me unions used to do mutual aid that was a a, a big thing and i think what i don't think they thought of it that way well, yeah, I mean, and what I was, you know, and I think what people are thinking of is like before they had strong unions and, you know, workers would have a loose organization and pull mm -hmm. resources for whatever. But I think what it's telling is they stopped doing that when they didn't have to. So right, when, yeah. when right, these benefits yeah. were enshrined in a contract, they didn't really need to do that. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like it, in, in my union contract, like if um, I don't need to raise funds to pay for a funeral, like it is built in a contract, even like legal help if I need yeah. um you know, help with a lawyer. So, yeah, you know, and again, if you're on a strike, I think that is different. You know, you can ha set up, uh, you know, food and, and all that sort of thing and get communities to do that. But it's like, you know, unions stop doing what we think of as mutual aid when they got it through their contracts, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I also want to point out that unions were, of course, instrumental trade unions were instrumental in pushing for the government to start doing those types of things or to start right. protecting mm -hmm. the right to do those types of things with a new deal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because, again, because again, that was, as you're saying, that was the default, those kind of like informal networks of support right. was the default prior to the new deal. Um, and labor leaders and trade unions were like, well, what if we actually enshrine this on some kind of federal level? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and yeah let me, the other, the yeah. other thing I, I would say is that I, I think the whole community community thing really puts the cart before the horse. Like mm. communities are formed by, um, you know, so much of, of this stuff is always about process and how you run a meeting and like HR. And it's very attractive mm. to a certain type of college educated leftist. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, communities, at least, you know, that aren't astroturfed in, um, are formed by, uh, you know, material conditions, shared interests, that kind of thing. And you do still see, I, I remember talking, I was interviewing someone who was with the Teamsters and particularly with the uh, sanitation Teamsters. Um, mm. And uh, I was looking at their website, which was like a like still like a Geo Cities website. It was like so funny. Oh like, hell yeah! It's, it's like, like from, Angel Fire. Or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like and, from 1992. <laughs> yeah. In yeah. addition to like you know we have to the you know the 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 drum and fife band for the Labor Day parade and so all, all those updates. They were like, we're taking up a collection to replace the church window at Saint Anthony's, and I was like, that's really funny. I'm like, are are the people in this local uh, still mostly Italian Catholics. He's like, oh no, they're mostly Caribbean now, but the tradition is still there. <laughs> Which is like this very, um, it's, 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 it gives you a history that mm -hmm. isn't just something that came from, and like people, people believe in that. People mm -hmm. like, you know, they, they want to uphold things that aren't even, because then it becomes their history, even mm -hmm. though, you know, mm -hmm. none of their fathers or grandfathers went to, St. Anthony's or whatever. Right, right. I also, I, so in, in a lot of the articles that I've been in reading about mutual aid, um, I, I think that there's a lot of, um, I mean, there, what I'm trying to say is like, there are a lot of moving stories, like actually genuinely moving stories of people, you right. know, kind of coming together during instances of hardship, um, yeah. sort of going out of their way to like, you know, like meet people that they hadn't met before or sort of, you know, or, or, or just in, in the face of what should be sort of unimaginable, like 
you know, hardship, like mm-hmm. finding a way to make it work. And I think that that is, I mean, that's, that's undeniably moving because it's again, kind of like the human spirit, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. However, it occurs to me that it's also, it reminds me a little bit of, you know, how there's occasionally a viral story that is supposed to be a feel good. Yeah. It's supposed to be like a feel good story. Like an opioid addict, like got out of rehab and was, you know, was homeless and didn't have shoes, but walked 17 miles to his new minimum wage job because he like had such work ethic and then the community banded together to get him a car or like a pair of oh, shoes or whatever. Right, yes. And yeah. it's like, okay, that's, I mean, like that is nice. Don't get me wrong. But like, that is just an indication of like how yeah. broken things are and how fucked capitalism is. I was going to say that the, 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 like this, this little boy had a lemonade stand to pay for his mother's chemotherapy. And it's like, <laughs> it's sweet. <Nice>. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me furious. Yeah, like, right. it makes me furious. Like it's we, just like, what the hell? We just had one in Philly. A, a Philly school principal took a job at Walmart at night to pay for like the most basic supplies for students. I'm like, I get. How do you just not read that in like horror? You yeah, know? It's, yeah. I, I, I'm. It's it, it, like it's strange to have this ambivalent relationship to the way people survive, where it's both heartwarming, but also you're disgusted. Right, right. right. <laughs> like you're like, oh, we yeah. live in a disgusting society. Right, it's right. not good enough for how good people are. Right, but right. I think the whole idea is, you know, given half a chance, uh, a well-functioning society does encourage the better angels of our nature. Of course. Um, but also, this stuff should run on autopilot, man. Mm-hmm. And right. the idea that we all have to be trained, um, you know, in a lot of it too is very strange to me. Is like, uh, it's sort of. They were like, let's deprofessionalize um, activism, which in some, it, it, I, I am very much uh, for this kind of deprofessionalization of things for which there are like arbitrary obstacles to the fact that you need, you know, a master's in social work to do certain things means that only rich people are going to be in charge of certain programs. It's, it's also like, you know, there's incredible burnout, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there are all kinds of things that people should be doing. I mean, like, uh, uh, people should be able to do certain things. But then the other thing is that, like, well, but this also involved tons and tons of training Mm -hmm. and tons and tons of skills development. And what you're suggesting is that uh, the decredentializing, which is, which I think a lot of things should be sort of decredentialized, um, but it's still professionalization. Like, these Mm -hmm. are still new skills. Like, Mm -hmm. all of that shit coordinating, like, I, I know specifically because I, I I did it when I worked at DSA, but coordinating spreadsheets, if there is a learning curve, it takes mm-hmm. a, it takes a long time to figure out. Some people are like lightning quick at it, and they can do things with the numbers and figure out the best routes to do mm-hmm. things. But it took them a while to get good at mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Um, so the suggestion is that everyone does every job, everyone is trained for every job. Mm -hmm. Um, That's just, that's insane to me. Mm -hmm. And again, there are just so many things that actually do need to be professionalized. I mean, like I, I, we need doctors Mm -hmm. (laughs) or or at least nurses for a lot of things. I think Mm -hmm. Catherine Liu had a good point where uh, she was talking about like, you know, the, like the, the barefoot doctors program. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That's so funny. I was just about to mention her, obviously Um, we had her on the show last week and um, you know, she, so, so I think one of the important distinctions that she made is that professionalization is great managerialization is a different can of worms altogether. Um, And that seems to be what kind of what you're talking about as well. Absolutely. And it's like, uh, you know, it, you don't have to be, you don't have to go through, you know, seven years of medical school to give someone a COVID inoculation. Mm-hmm. Um, honestly, it's, I, I haven't asked around, but my true sus- suspicion is that you could probably train people to do it pretty easily. Mm-hmm. Um, and mm-hmm. like the barrier to that. But when it comes to like, I need a, an internist. I right. we, I think the key is, you know, yeah. like professionalization should be open to everyone. Mm-hmm. Truly, you know, exactly. currently you got to go in through a thousand dollars of debt to yeah. be a doctor, exactly. you know. Exactly. Um, but I'm, I'm glad you brought up kind of earlier about, you know, not everything that feels good is socialism because, you know, I'm never going to sit here and say that if you participate in mutual aid, you're a bad person. If you give out food, you're bad. The, 
Panthers were bad for, for the free breakfast program. Mm -hmm. It's not about that. You know, yeah. obviously these are generally good things. It's a more of a question of strategy and I think priorities. And I was really glad in the last show I was on with, with Jane McAlevey, um, she really emphasized priorities. And that's another thing where I look at with this mutual aid is that what I just mentioned about the public sector and fighting austerity. I mean, mm -hmm. look, in, in this next year, most states and cities, the left is going to lose on austerity. That's because mm -hmm. it's like incredibly hard to fight this stuff. And it's like everyone, I think, has been in a meeting where you pick out four or five action items. And then the next day you realize, like, there's just no way we're actually going to do all this stuff. And, mm -hmm. you know, like we, we got to choose where are we going to go all in? And I think austerity well, makes yeah. perfect sense to go all in. And it's very easy to say, well, we can do this and that and this and that. But, you know, and even hearing Jane talk about uh, what it takes to win, I know it kind of, she rattles it off like it's easy, but what she was saying is a, an, a hell of a lot of work and resources mm -hmm. to go into it. And I'm like, yeah. why don't we do that? You know, and it's <laughs> right. like, even, mm -hmm. you know, I'll give credit to, some of these mutual aid programs that are run very well, but I bet you, you probably got to focus on just doing that if you're going to run it well, mm -hmm. you know? So I think this is a right. matter of po political priorities and, and strategy. Yeah, Nye Bevin, uh, the, just the architect of the NHS had that great quote, like priorities is the religion of socialism. Mm, right. um, and I think um, what a lot of people, you know, Spade is very big on this, it's like, uh, he talks about people working on their issue silos and it's like, yeah, that's, that's good. Like it, having an issue silo is good. That's called focus. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there was a damage, uh, kind of polemic called everything all of the time. Mm. Uh, that was very good. That was just like, well, we can't talk about this and we can't talk about that if we don't talk about this and we don't talk mm -hmm. about it's like, well, then we're never going to do anything. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think also you'll find you just get more people working on issues rather mm -hmm. than right. what is essentially a cultural project. I mean, my grandpa like has voted Republican. He supports, he supports socialized healthcare. It's like, he's like, mm. Oh, this is ridiculous. Oh, look, they have it over here. Why don't we have that? Like, I mean, to me, there's nothing that's going to be, more beneficial to uh, the trade union movement, which I see as like a power building institution as weak as, as it is at the moment, um, than, than socialized healthcare. The idea that I need everyone to be a socialist before they fight for that, like that's, that's insane. Also, right. it's just, it just slices away our numbers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but he does, I'm pretty sure, I've never asked, believe there are only two genders. I, uh, <laughs> Is this your is this your grandpa who looks like Colin Powell? Yes. <laughs> oh wow. Like a lot. <laughs> um, no, I mean I I also want to add to, you know, Paul, what you were saying about austerity is something that doesn't really sit right with me with the discourse around mutual aid, is that it 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 feels very much like it's about, you know, sharing what we have when like we have to be asking for more. Like you were saying earlier, Amber, like how are we gonna expropriate this shit? Right. <laughs> and what to what Amber said about you know choosing issues, what does actually appeal to me about austerity is it really does touch on so many different issues. It, it touch on touches on labor, workers' rights. It touches on public education. It touches on infrastructure. So like, I, I mean, this is why I mean I've just been on this in evangelizing about the public sector and austerity because like this is such a good moment to go all in. It mm -hmm. affects rural communities. It affects urban communities. Yeah. It affects white, mm -hmm. black, you know. Yeah, you yeah. Know, and, and like we like, said earlier, people want to go all in, or people want the government to go all in. You know, like yeah. people are very right. amenable, especially right now in this moment of crisis, to expanding the scope of government aid. And like, I mean, I don't know. Like, how can we take advantage of that? Well, and, and I think too, like the you know the the video you showed earlier people have very like intimate relationships yeah. with the public sector that mm -hmm. are like you know multi-generational and even when they're gone like my family is still like loves the railroad union like and it's like it was like my my they don't exist i mean like it's, it's a very weird thing but like you know the like 
everyone in my family, even down to the, the younger kids on that side of my family, have something from, have some Chesapeake Railroad swag. From, uh, <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, from the, from the, has, it, has a kitty cat on it. Um, from the, you know, from the era when trains were a thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was such a, it's, it's, a, or if you look at like the, you know, the tradition of, of mining in, in the UK, mm -hmm. you know, they still have, um, you know, the, they still have like the, the biggest labor festival, like mm -hmm. in yeah. the world. And it's, even though there are only like three coal miners left or something. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, Thatcher, Thatcher, um, Destroyed, destroyed the industry uh, yeah. for, it, 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 at expense to the country too. It wasn't even more lucrative. She just, she was a true ideological capitalist. She was such a capitalist that her commitment to capitalism overrode her commitment to profit, which is an interesting situation. <laughs> right. Um, it cost gotta, her gotta admire that, than, I guess. Yeah, gosh. True, true ideologue. Her, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if, if you want to talk about community, like that's something that really that really resonates with people. And I guess one of the things that I think, or maybe I, I would be interested to hear what, what you guys have to say, but like for people who don't have that relationship, who don't have a you know, historical or cultural or family uh, memory of uh, you know, labor or church something mm. that held people together, I think mutual aid seems like maybe they think they can kind of astroturf it in or, or um, like, it seems like they, they like the idea of that kind of a community because they never had a good one. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, I just made myself sad. Uh, <laughs> but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like, again, I mean, in the, in the absence of a much more difficult and longer term project of like overturning neoliberal ideology, mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, I mean, what can we do now? Mm -hmm. And what can we do that seems solidaristic mm -hmm. and offers a sense of community when we're in neoliberalism, you know? Yeah. Um, what do you think about the, um, I mean, I, I was, I am sort of heartened by the essential workers, like, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause yeah. it's like, even people, you know, PMC people are like, Oh, thank God for the mailman. You know? Like, <laughs> right. Well, well, it's funny. I was going to, this draws like three things that were going on in my mind together. But I mean, what you were saying about this deep, personal experience of the public sector. I just wanted to tell an anecdote from, you know, last summer when um, the post office was actually all the rage when they were threatening not to fund it and all this stuff. Yeah. You know, our DSA chapter worked with the Postal Workers Union Philly to fly her at post offices across the country, not the country, uh, across Philadelphia, which mm -hmm. to me is a country. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go again. Right. <laughs> so, There's, Like, no, we're, we're anti-federalist, but except like a free, uh, all for a free, free Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Right. At, hashtag free Philly. Um, <laughs> so anyway, but, you know, it was, so many people said it was like the easiest flyering they ever did because everyone was for it. You know, like yeah, no yeah. one, no one is against it. And, you know, this one guy I, I flyered, he was a middle aged black guy. And he said, you know, the post service means much, so much to me. You know, I got out of prison. They were the one um, yeah. thing that I, I could get a job at, you know, yeah. without them, I'd probably be back in prison. And yeah. I mean, again, this is just such a real tangible thing to people. And I, what you just said about the essential workers, I think there is an opportunity now to build on this like public sentiment around essential workers. Mm -hmm. And guess what? The Postal Workers Union contract expires in September. Mm. I think that's a real flashpoint for like the left to rally behind, mm -hmm. you know, a strong contract and tap into this public sentiment and, you know, kind of revive these ideas about the public sector. You know, I think, you know, again, I'd rather see our energy, you know, our emotional, mental and physical energy kind of go into stuff like that, yeah. and, you know, rather than other things. Yeah. Well, you talk, uh, you know, when you talk about like, uh, you know, black workers in the post office, which is again, uh, other than like the military uh, probably been more responsible for like, you know, the sort of economic improvement of, of black people's lives. Um, like the public sector has also been the like major vehicle for, um, for integrating women into the workforce, yeah. um, particularly in, uh, in European welfare states. Um, and kind of the only way that people were able to, uh, they were able to say that 
one, w- w- you know, women get to work. That's cool. Uh, but two, retaining. I'm retaining, pro that. Just yeah. so you know, <laughs> I'm pro. I am just not, <laughs> not me personally. Um, <laughs> but two, like doing that without uh, completely, um, uh, like turning the turning the work itself into. Uh, oh, e- every household has to be a two income household. Mm-hmm. Um, so. It, the contrast with the with the way that the welfare states developed through investing in um, in in publics in Europe is is very stark mm-hmm. because uh, you know women entered the workforce um, you know it, 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 the, in the U.S. during the war and then we just never left um, and uh, and what that meant was a, a moving of the goalpost. It's like well you both work now. So right. we don't really have to keep up with inflation. We don't really right. have to raise wages. There are two incomes in a family now. Of course mm-hmm. there are. Um, women being in being in being in the public sector is is huge for welfare. Mm-hmm. Right. It's the only thing we have. I mean, like it's called public for a reason. We have more control over it, mm-hmm. you know, theoretically, uh, than uh, than than the private sector and. Moreover, I think history has borne that out um, with tons of evidence, which mm-hmm. you just can't say for something like mutual aid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, and I think, sorry, I got to get this point out. Um, again, yeah, we're talking about, the, yeah. talk about the New Deal. You know, I, the question for me, again, is what is the legacy? And again, despite what Jen and I have been saying, we're not denying the, you know, racial exclusionary a- aspects of the New Deal. But again, talk about a legacy you want to talk about how racist it is, go up to an older black person now, even a Republican, and try to take their social security. Right. And see what they say. I mean, yeah. and that's what, even despite we're living in like neoliberal hell, mm-hmm. they still actually have not yet found out how to cut social security. Don't, I mean, right, yeah. don't get me wrong. Yeah. yeah, don't get me and wrong. And it's there's, really easy to get oh, social security. Trying. Yeah. Right, yeah. They're trying, yeah. And I, I, don't, trying. Uh, I don't doubt that they can, but you know, I, I kind of would have expected they would have done this by now, but that it's just stronger. speaks to like the legacy yeah. and how important it is to people, you mm-hmm. know, that all this time they still can't uh, get rid of it yet. Sure. Mm-hmm. Or, or Thatcher with the NHS, like, yeah, you bet your ass she would love to get right. have gotten rid of it. Mm-hmm. But she said, oh, no, there would be riots. <laughs> It's a stronger institution. That doesn't mean it can't be uh, right. it can't be obliterated or chipped right. away at. And certainly death by a thousand cuts. Mm-hmm. You know, austerity, right. yeah. austerity even, even Boris people. Johnson now is talking about yeah, he yeah. was forced to at least, you know, praise the NHS and, and promise some funding, you know. You gotta. Yeah, yeah. Um that's 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 actual social pressure. But let me ask you though, why do you think that uh, the left or whatever um, hasn't taken up social security as a major cause. I mean, like, I'm still a little like miffed that uh, that you know. I mean, whatever. I want obviously I want university to be, to be free and mm-hmm. public and everything, but it's like, what about childcare? Something mm-hmm. that affects. I mean, like, just to the. The number of people who reproduce versus the number of people who, you know, want a professional degree. I mean, it's just no contest. But mm-hmm. the number of people who are going to get old, if you're lucky, is like kind of all of us. Right, right. Uh, beats the alternative anyway. Um, so I don't know. Is it just that like, and, and again, too, talking about communities, like most of what people are talking about here is not a community because a community is multi-generational. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like, when there are a whole bunch of old people, you know, participating in your thing, I'll be like, okay, you have a community. When you have different generations of people with children, um, you know, then I'll say like that's a community. But uh, I mean, it seems like the the silence is really like deafening. Is it just because like it's a young people interest or whatever? But like, I I, I like my grandparents. I don't want their social security to be cut. Right. They really need it. They're terrible with money, so of course they need it. <laughs> like, I don't, yeah, know. I don't know. I mean, I don't have like a great answer. I, I don't. I mean, I think part of it is not really the sexiest thing in the world, um, you know. And I think it, well, it kind of sexy, right? <laughs> um, they, 
also, I think like when this was a big fight during the Obama years, you know, I think the left was at a different state. I don't know. Maybe I hope that if it becomes a thing again under Biden, that maybe mm -hmm. in the post burning moment, there will be mm -hmm. more of like an outrage about it. But yeah, I, mean, I think that's a good point, you know, and like, and again, I think we should be looking at not only the good fights to have because they're good fights, but like, mm -hmm. what are the good allies we're making? And it's like, you know, the AFGE, the Federal Employees Union, they they would be all down to fight on that and unite with allies. Um, even mm -hmm. I'll give Jay McAlevey credit for this. Uh, she had this idea of like, why isn't the left uh, uniting around VA centers, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and um, you that's, know, that's some people's only relationship to wealth. Right. People. And that's an right. issue that's right. like impossible for someone to really be against politically. And it, it's going to be, it would make it very hard for the right wing to, you know, well, it almost on that. suggests that they're not political so much as cultural. Mm, yeah. Uh, if you're, yeah, I was if you're say, avoiding it's the obvious like VA. Yeah. 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 This um this this kind of seems also indicative of the split between what I think um sort of get prioritized as as sort of like left causes when the left is predominantly, you know, college educated middle class people, um, and what right. the like broader public is interested in. Because like, you know, like you were saying, Paul, like people really love social security. I I think I mean, it's and that's why that's I'm sorry, my dad's about to be 70. It's all he talks about. Like 50% yeah, no, right, of our right, conversations right. is like yeah. social security but, check. Right, yeah. right, totally, totally. And social security, I mean, like even if Biden, if Biden does nothing, social security is still in danger because it will run out, you know? Um, right. Because, well, because it's I'm an sorry, incredibly I'm simple fix too. Just raise exactly. the cap. So exactly, simple. exactly. It's because so the simple. cap is still in place. Yeah. The other thing I would say too is that all those you know, up where the ass kid with lemonade stands, you know, kind of the things like anyone who goes to a big box store sees like a Walmart greeter and it's like, you're too old. Like, I know. Like yeah, that's, seriously. And you're not working because you love it. You need something to do. Like, like elder poverty is insane in this country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is. Yeah. I mean, like, I, th I think Indiana might be like the number one state for mm -hmm. senior poverty. So like, I, it might be more of a thing for me, but you just see people like unable to heat their houses mm -hmm. and people who are working way past with the age when they should. It's right. like, you should be surrounded by grandchildren you don't like very much and enjoy <laughs> right. you earned <laughs> you earned like to be able to chill out and you know whatever volunteer do whatever you want that's what it is you work or just sit on your porch work. with a shotgun that's fine yeah. too but like, you deserve it <laughs> yeah but like i i i think it's um it, it it's just so stark and like visible to me mm -hmm. um and i think what people talk about when they get into sort of generational politics they're like the boomers did this the boomers did that it's like mm. What are you talking about? You're just talking about your grandparents. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> there are poor, very poor older people everywhere mm -hmm. and they're yeah. ending their lives with just zero dignity. And mm -hmm. I don't understand. Um, it seems like uh, it seems like the, the the focus on everything all of the time that comes from the kind of a you know mutual aid model. Mm -hmm. actually narrow it does have a narrow scope yeah yeah specifically because it it conceives of the interests of a small group of people mm -hmm. but is not actually like um you know a campaign or or issue focused mm -hmm. um and something like austerity that's a that's such a again it covers so it covers so mm -hmm. many things like that is a comprehensive and inclusive thing that is nonetheless an issue mm -hmm. that can be right. consolidated. That fits in as many people as you possibly can um, into uh, like a, a single mission, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. to me, uh, you know, the, the sort of arguments for mutual aid are the worst of both worlds, if that makes any sense. Right, <laughs> right, yeah. And I think some of these, you know, I did a segment in the last show on the ballot measure that was successful in Arizona, I'm taxing the rich. And, and you know, examples like that kind of make me very skeptical of the idea like, well, you do mutual aid to establish contact and then you talk about issues. It's like, I mean, when you have a campaign, you talk about issues. You do the same thing, yeah. yeah you know, right. you, I mean, just get to the issue right, first. Like you don't have and to bait and switch. Also, it's also, yeah, people, you know, people it's like, aren't, also people aren't stupid. Right. Yeah. Like they'll, they'll, they're like, people know, you know, how to say the Lord's prayer so they can get their bowl of soup, but they will 
hate you. They will resent you for that. Mm -hmm. They know that this is that this is tit for tat. It underestimates people's intelligence to presume that they won't figure out that you're trying to indoctrinate them in this circuitous, frankly, coercive way because mm -hmm. they are in need. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the, the anarchists are all about this coercion. Like, that's a kind of coercion. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing is, I, I think that my ideas and my general political commitments, you know, not down to some sort of granular policy-based thing, I think they're good enough to sell to people on their own. I don't think I have to... Tr trade someone's survival to indoctrinate them. In fact, I think that breeds kind of very understandable resentment. Mm -hmm. That's why Preacher and the Slave was such a like a, you know, a, a, a salient song. It's like these people who uh, claim to be helping the poor, but are in fact evangelizing them. And it's like, man, fuck you. I don't want to go to your meeting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Amber, we're going to let you go after this, but I feel like one last thing that we should touch on is that a lot of mutual aid, um, a lot of, a lot of the, maybe not the rhetoric around mutual aid, but a lot of what mutual aid uh, is trying to do is not that dissimilar from what right-wing libertarians also want to do, which is roll right. back the state and transfer, again, transfer the social safety net back to the community or back to, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess in the case of the right, you know, oftentimes it's more like churches or like, I don't know, like, you know, other institutions, but well, at the I, same time, I, I would argue that people who, you know, uh, sub who get, I would argue that Verso readers are kind of their own church at this point. <laughs> like, it is, it is a small group of people with a, mm -hmm. a shared set of like moral uh, values and interests, which again is fine. I also mm -hmm. think it's fine if people go to church. Maybe, of course, maybe yeah. go maybe go to church, and that would make you. I some <laughs> of the best leftists I know, like like I go to church for my moral mm, do goodery, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and you know my moral guidance. And they're like, and I do politics mm -hmm. for to create a world that's more egalitarian and that you know allows me to explore mm -hmm. moral. Like mm -hmm. they're just separate right. things, right? Um, I, I also want to point out David Harvey has a really good quote, um, or he had an interview in Jacobin a while ago where he pointed out that um, for every sort of um, for every sort of type of you know production, there is a corresponding uh, backlash from the left that matches that. So his example was like you know during during like the era of Fordist production, you saw a very strong centralized labor movement kind right. of going up against that form of capital. Now under neoliberalism, when things are flexible and you know um, kind of dispersed uh, and and atomized and individualized. Uh, he provocatively made the claim that left movements right now match that as well. Um, and he's saying, oh, wow. we need to, yeah, I know it's so good. Um, uh, maybe we'll find oh, the article and like link that below brain. too. Yeah. I think <laughs> it, 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 that, that kind of mirrors the uh, Rene Rojas piece in Catalyst, which people should really, um, I forget what it's called, but it's about the pink tide and kind right. of- Oh, that's such a good article. Yeah, yeah, I mean, kind of the same thing, like the Latin American left of the 60s and 70s, you know, were in this Fordist mode and they had more structural power because the working class yeah. had more structural power and, and today they don't. And you kind of see that in these pink tide governments. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, wow. Oh, I'm actually gonna have to think about that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah I, I mean, also, his I also, question I is like, how do we break out this. of that mirroring? How do we break out of that, like, you know, like funhouse mirroring where like the left movements just sort of resemble the, right. yeah, I don't, I, yeah. I don't, I don't, and, I don't, I don't be, know either. Yeah. I mean, to be fair to, you know, and it is tough because again, it's like the average leftist, the average person is not going to have that personal experience of a union or like mm -hmm. unions are so weak. So like it's the entry point is harder. So yeah. The history is you know. going away. Um, well, I mean, I, I would say that like this is, that that is what I would say my um, sort of uh, project is or, or whatever is to be like, you know, there was a time when we were big and strong <laughs> and uh, it was because of these, these certain right. things. Now, I, the response that people would sort of like give me and they're like, oh yeah, but the, 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 the labor movement is weak. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, so make it strong. Like, look, I'm right. not saying 
it's uh, easy, it's mm-hmm. very difficult, but difficult is not the same thing as complicated. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and, I mean, it's very yeah. uncomplicated what we need to do. It's just very hard. It's, you know, whatever, uh, climbing, uh, climbing a mountain. It's very simple. You just get to the top. <laughs> but it's very difficult. Right. Although right. not complicated, not complicated at all. Yeah. And this is maybe to end on a positive note. I mean, to me, this is what was so important about the Red for Red teacher strikes. Not just the, um, uh, not just the fact that they won and that was great, but like all those people, this was their first strike. Mm-hmm. And it was an incredibly... Mm-hmm. They're going to remember that forever. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. a powerful experience. They won't forget. And they also remember that they won. And it was They're really... Tell children about that. Right. Like, and it was yeah. really touching to see, you know, young, youngish West Virginian people talking about they were tapping into the history of like, yeah, my parents were minors mm-hmm. or my grandparents yeah. and like, mm-hmm. this is what we do, but they never actually did it themselves. Yeah, You know, so I, we just need more experiences like that to yeah. start rebuilding, you know, get this train going again. But yeah. those powerful experiences are, you know, are really crucial. Yeah, I mean, as much as it's, it's I, to me, it's, it's very tragic um, uh, sort of that, that the, the, the the direct memories of people with like a, you know, militant or even just active trade union participation or, you know, they're kind of dying away or whatever. But I have to say, like, I'm incredibly grateful that like, I have a sense of that and that, um, you know, that that was a part of my family because it, it does keep me centered and uh, it helps me sort of imagine a world because I know that it existed before when workers had some power and 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 were building it um and uh i don't know I, every, even though it puts me in a position every once in a while when i'm like podcast and i'm like my dad was a union roofer and i'm a podcast <laughs> <laughs> like it's just like, like I, have, I have all these Amber, like, just, there's these, always work at the post office <laughs> right? don't, don't forget that <laughs> yeah like, if the whole thing gets tits up i'll start carrying letters uh, but it is, it is, I, I think, I think a, a lot of it is like, it's the kind of, uh, proletarianization of like formerly professional, like middle-class people who are for the first time doing worse than their parents. Mm-hmm. It, it was always expected they would go to school and get a white collar job and what white collar jobs now are so debased. They're not, they're not the fun madmen get drunk on the lunch break, kind of sexually harass the the secretary like uh you know that's they they're now in this incredibly precarious horrible situation but they don't have the parents or 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 the grandparents that i had where they're where they are have something to imagine so maybe that is why you know or one of the reasons why the the harvey thing is going on Mm -hmm. um but i mean you know for 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 institutions like jacobin i think um we have this amazing opportunity to just remind people. We don't have to say, imagine a world where people all hold hands and, you know, and that, like, you know, these aspirations, like, we don't have to imagine. We have to remember mm-hmm. because it did happen and we can do it again and we can do it bigger and we can do it stronger. But I, I don't think we have time really to experiment with things with nothing but a, a broken track record of um, yeah. of failure. Mm-hmm. Why don't we do the thing that works? Worked before, yeah. It's just that's just me. What if we did the thing that works? Um, Amber, on that note, twenty twenty four. That's your yeah, slogan. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about that? Did anyone ever think of that? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, on that note, and also since you mentioned Jacobin, um, just want to remind everybody that Amber Frost's article on mutual aid will be forthcoming in Jacobin. So check back here for the link in the description box. Um, Amber, a pleasure as always. And thank you very much for coming on. Thanks so much for having me on. Uh, be good. Do a little charity work. Go to church and then do politics. All, All right, right. Bye. Thanks, Amber. Bye, Amber. <laughs>